I'm going to talk about the role of the role of energy efficient technologies, but particularly in the sense of, of what is feasible and realistic, and we'll, we'll find that the time scale over which these technologies might have impact is a very, very important issue and not that well understood. I'm going to present a series of summary conclusions and back some of these up with, with a little data so that we, we do stay quantitatively grounded. And the first point is that even those of us involved in this area professionally have a difficult time recognizing what the scale of our energy and emissions from transportation uh, really is. And here's some data worldwide transport, transport well to wheels uh, CO2, greenhouse gas emissions, starting along the bottom scale with today, 2000, and going out to 2050. And you can see that there's growth, growth, growth. But the first thing to say is that the amount is massive. And the lesson from that is, even with the best of intentions and very vigorous action, changing things on this scale takes longer than we're willing to admit. And then growth compounds this. And all those sectors are growing. The light blue one at the bottom is, is the light duty vehicles, the, the private vehicle fleet. The red is freight, which is growing more rapidly and becoming increasingly significant, as is obvious. And then air, the light green sector, is also growing significantly. But they're all growing, not necessarily in every part of the world, but most parts of the world. Now, what can technology provide? Well, I've put some overview numbers on this slide, and I've said a 30 to 50% reduction in fuel consumption. And let me stress, fuel consumption is the right parameter. I'm driving from Boston to New York. How much fuel I use matters, not what my miles per gallon is. And so liters per 100 kilometers, the European measure, is the right one. So 30 to 50% reduction is feasible, 30% comes pretty much from improving mainstream technology to get to 50%, we certainly would need to go into a significant number of hybrid vehicles. Now, the time scales vary too, and I've laid these out below. Uh, 20 years, we can expect significant improvement in, in gasoline, petrol engines, in diesel engines, transmissions, vehicle weight, size, tire resistance, drag, all the vehicle issues can be reduced. And then in a midterm sense, uh, having impact perhaps between 20, 30 years from now, and that is impact. Of course, there are hybrids out there already, but not enough to have any significant impact yet. That's, in my judgment and, and my own team's judgment, uh, midterm. And then the long term looks ahead to plug-in hybrids, uh, hydrogen fuel cells with hydrogen and perhaps electric vehicles. My sense, and I put 40 years here, is that we should watch our optimism. This is harder than we think. It's pretty expensive technology. It requires changes in the energy supply system that we haven't yet really defined. And my own judgment is that we don't have a compelling vision yet for electricity and hydrogen uh, in the transportation area. Nobody has put up a statement that makes us say yes. And the big problem is that the electricity has to be green and clean, and the hydrogen has to be green and clean. And our efforts, our, our understanding of how to do that at present is limited we don't have that compelling vision. A very important factor in assessing what technology can do for us is this built-in trade-off between fuel consumption, uh, vehicle performance, and size and weight. To illustrate it, in the last 25 years in the United States, uh, fuel consumption has not really changed. 
but the technology's got better, the engines have got better, transmissions have got better, vehicle components have improved, but we've put those that we put that better technology into offsetting increased performance and larger size. And it's the performance that's the really big factor. <laughs> now, Europe has done better and has mixed where it's put this improved technology, partly into improved performance, but partly into directly reducing fuel consumption. And I want to illustrate that. We've defined a parameter which we call the degree of emphasis on reducing fuel consumption. It's defined in this slide. It's the actual fuel consumption reduction, the improvement realized, divided by what we would get if we kept vehicle performance and vehicle size constant. So zero obviously means we get no fuel reduction. 100% means that performance stays the same and size stays the same. And it's a very powerful parameter. Here's some data. This graph on the vertical scale has got uh, performance, 0 to 100 kilometer per hour acceleration time, and the horizontal scale is fuel consumption, liters per 100 kilometers. In the upper right, we've got today's vehicle, that little black uh, diamond, and the weight of the average U.S. car uh, today is illustrated there. And if we come vertically downward, which has got this 0% emphasis on reducing fuel consumption, then the fuel consumption stays the same, about 9.5 liters per 100 kilometers, but the performance goes down from 9.5 seconds acceleration time down to something about 6. Now, if we emphasize fuel consumption, which is the horizontal dashed line, you see that we stay with the same performance, and with some weight reduction, we really can reduce the fuel consumption down to about six liters per kilometer significantly. So put this in, in a context, think of it in a normalized way. Uh, we've looked 25 or so years ahead, and that solid line, the, the, the sloping line on that graph is where we could be, but we can be anywhere on that line in theory. The challenge is that history says we're at the worst end of that line in terms of fuel consumption because we keep buying and using higher performance. Now, the, sec the, the second point I want to make is to look at impact, we have to put this technology out there into the fleet. One car makes no difference. Millions and millions and millions of cars does make a difference, and so we've got to have technology that is marketable that consumers buy and then obviously consumers use. And the vehicle turnover in the fleet or park is slow. The average lifetime is on the order of um, 15 years. Now let me illustrate the importance of doing these fleet studies. And I sometimes say nobody should make strategic pronouncements or put forward policies in the transportation sector without having done fleet studies or having a staff of people who do fleet studies, because without fleet studies, we have no idea what the impact over time is likely to be. A key ingredient is looking at how rapidly can these new technologies penetrate through sales into the, the in-use vehicle fleet or park. And this shows, in some of our scenarios, this shows one of our scenarios where this is the production buildup of a variety of technologies. And if we start at the bottom, uh, looking at the long-term future, on the right it's 2035, that, hot, that vertical dashed line. We've got diesels, gasoline hybrids, plug-in hybrids, uh, turbocharged gasoline engines in the proportions that the different bands show. And then the remainder are improved uh, conventional petrol gasoline engines. This is a many technology mix, but it illustrates. To look at the impact, we have to assume rates of penetration. And our own assessments suggest these are longer, slower than we would like. And then we have to, dis have to distinguish between what do I want to happen, what do I think should happen, what do I think is likely to happen, and then what can I do to speed it up? And we've got to 
we've got to be careful. Often we talk about what I want to happen. Often we talk about what I or you think needs to happen. We've got to be careful with what question we're addressing. So this is a significant penetration of different technologies, but over a 25-year time span, many people think we can do it quicker. History says we haven't done it quicker yet. Now the impact from a fleet study is illustrated here, and the vertical scale in this case is the, the total petroleum-based fuel consumption expressed in gasoline equivalent. This is for the United States, so diesel is barely a, a big deal. It is a big deal in Europe. Um, and so the top of the curve over time is no change. It shows growth in fleet, growth in kilometers, miles traveled, and it goes from today, 2,000 odd, up to 2035. And what you see is the, the various uh, triangles or wedges uh, the light blue is improved standard engines, improved with transmissions, some weight reduction, and then the, the, the different colored thin slices are what those percentages of turbocharged gasoline, diesel, and hybrids produce for us. And what you see is you have to go to about 20, 20, 20, 25 before there's much impact, but then the impact grows. And if we extend further, then it's going to be these advanced technologies that have a big impact. Now, this is assuming 50% of the improving technology goes into reducing fuel consumption directly. If we wave our magic wand and, and offer a prayer and get 100% of the improvements into reducing fuel consumption, we increase these numbers significantly. So that's a very important parameter. So the overall message here is that through fleet studies, we can learn how quickly things can change. And of course, it depends on how rapidly we get new technology out there. That is very much a judgment issue. It, it may well be forced by policies, but ultimately, consumers have got to buy this technology, so the costs are extremely important. Now let me end by contrasting petroleum reduction and greenhouse gas emissions. And I put a statement here that the vehicle and fuel opportunities uh, through technology to displace petroleum rather than reduce greenhouse gas emissions are, are much larger. It's hard enough displacing petroleum and changing the technology, changing what people buy, changing how people use this technology it's even harder with the greenhouse gas emissions because there are a series of negatives, degrading factors that mean it's harder. And I've illustrated two here. Plug-in hybrids would shift perhaps half of the vehicle energy from petroleum-based fuels to electricity. But for that to give a greenhouse gas reduction, requires a green, clean electricity generating system and that electricity going into the transportation sector. That, it's not obvious that will happen. It certainly will not happen, say, in the United States in, in the short term. I think it varies in major ways, country to country in Europe, what the electricity generating system, what it's based on, what its greenhouse gas emissions are. The second illustration is that, yes, we've been very enthusiastic about biomass fuels, but they do, but while they do displace petroleum, their impact on greenhouse gas emissions is less. And here's a slide that looks at the percentage change on the vertical scale uh, as we look into the future out to 2035. And lines that go up from the horizontal, things are getting worse. Lines that come down uh, are getting better. And in this particular study we completed, We've got non-conventional oil in 2035 providing 10% of the energy. In the US, that would come from oil sands from Canada. Um, uh, there'll be a gas to liquids component in, in Europe. But these all increase the greenhouse gas emissions, even though they do provide a very useful stream of liquid fuels for transportation. And so you see that the, the purple color uh, at the top has a negative. And then we've put 7% corn ethanol and 7% cellulosic ethanol. 
Corn ethanol doesn't do much uh, in a U.S. context. Uh, cellulosic, if it gets going the way we hope and expect, it does do something. But you can see that 25% of the energy from alternative fuels produces a 5 to 6% reduction in greenhouse gases. So those are my messages, and I'll stop there.